My name is Cecilia Oldner and I represent Sweden India Business Council. Uh, Sweden India Business Council, uh, as you can see, uh, is very much the main organizer of this event. And I thought it could be good to take a step back and understand uh, why we're here today and why we organized the event. Well, that is to connect our members, our partners, and also uh, the members of India Sweden Business Leaders Roundtable, uh, the Sweden India Transport Innovation and Safety Platform, and the Sweden India Tech Community. So earlier today, of course, we have the Leif Johansson, the chairman of AstraZeneca, um, welcoming us in the welcome address together with also Ambassador Tanmaya Lal and others. Um, and where we are today is in Gothenburg. It is uh, very much a hub of uh, life science of health tech, AstraZeneca being here. Um, and uh, we also are in Gothenburg for the reason that we work very closely with business region uh, Gothenburg. Ulf Landin sits on the board of Sweden India Business Council. And um, yes, he's also here in uh, on front row today. I'm very happy to see that. Uh, so. Uh, it's important for you to understand what we're doing. We really want to connect uh, Sweden and India in all the different sectors that we are operating in. And here we are going to talk more about a subject that is very close to my heart. And that is, again, life science and medicine. So with no further delay, I wanted to introduce to you uh, also from, of course, the business region Gothenburg, Iris, and Iris Örn, she is the um, advisor, the life science investment advisors at the business region Gothenburg. And uh, we've had the opportunity to, to spend some time together. I'm just really impressed about what all she's doing. And she has uh, put together this amazing panel with, of course, uh, members and partners of Sweden in the Business Council, but also people that she works really closely with. And uh, therefore, I'm going to have you, Iris, introduce this panel and take it from here. Welcome on stage. Thank you very much. And welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, and I'm very honored to be presenting this fantastic panel. We have here beside, we have Ulla Enqvist. You are a professor at Chalmers, but you are also the head of molecular AI and discovery at AstraZeneca. We have Lash Linwelt representing both AI Sweden and the Best Talan region, the County Council in West Sweden. We have Char Lota Gumenson, CEO of Solgreska Science Park, and we have joining us online from India, Vijay Chandru, you are in Bangladesh right now, and we have also from India, but this time joining us from Norway, Sachin Gaur. Uh, just to say, Vijay is actually the founder of the company Strand Life Science, which is now also uh, from the industrial group Reliance Life Science. And as I said, we also have from India, but this time from Norway, Sachin Gaur, which is senior advisor of Nura AI. Welcome, everybody. And today we are going to talk about life science, healthcare, AI, data, and everything within the frame of Sweden and India. And we will start by talking about something that many people ask for, and it's actually competence. And I will start by asking you, Ula, mm -hmm. uh, we all know that AstraZeneca is a very international company. You have people over 70 different nationalities working here at Mondol. And uh, I also know that you look for competence locally, uh, but also, of course, internationally. So I would like to know for the work that you do with AI and discovery, which kind of competences are you looking for and where do you find it? Okay, so I'm, some, I'm very sorry for, for a very concrete. For very concrete <laughs> answer, that <laughs> can, might be more difficult. So of course, we look for, for talent globally, particularly in fields like uh, data science and AI, where I think there's still a, a global lack of uh, educated people. I think it's catching up the education, I think particularly on, on the, the master's level, but I think there's still a gap on the PhD level. What we particularly are looking for are experts that can bridge, say, two fields like, like AI and medicine or AI or biology or maybe AI or robotics. So that's something more than just the AI component. And uh, another field we are also interested in is because we are generating so much data is the AI engineer. 
that actually not only can build models and evaluate models and present models to a project, but actually can do that with massive data sets. And a lot of the latest state of the, art, the architecture and deep learning like transformers. So I hope I was concrete enough. Is it enough. easy to find? Uh, it's uh, very difficult to find. <laughs> it is. And of course, we, we are looking all over the world. And if you know someone that would be interested <laughs> with the competence, <laughs> please contact me, definitely. OK, so I see it is a challenge for, for a large company like AstraZeneca, of mm. course, to have people and to find people that have access, that knows skills related to AI and digitalization and now I would like to ask you Lota as the CEO of Sol Greca Science Park because I know that you are working with SMEs and with all other companies within life sciences do you think or have you see an increase in the demand for AI related competencies is it something that the companies you work with are also looking for <laughs> thank you Iris yes we definitely see in this part of Sweden and in the Nordics an increase in, uh, in demands for working with health tech and the possibility that health tech and the life science industry gives. And uh, so almost all entrepreneurs and companies that we meet with uh, and their health tech solutions have AI as one component, but that is only one component and technique of many. And when it comes to, 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 having, to, to dealing with patients' data or your personal data, um, we see an increase in demand on how to, how to use the data. And, and challenging is data readiness for AI. So how do you get the data? Is it secure enough? And are, are the sensors connected with the data secure enough? Are, are they evidence-based and so on. So it's very many different type of competences that are needed. And um, so what we see also is to an increased demand in when it comes to data vi visualization. And I, I heard such a great, uh, I, I never heard it before, because I was talking actually to, to Siddhartha, uh, an Indian, uh, being here from India, uh, he, he is here and he, he has this company Walkbeat. And I know that Cecilia told me he's a, also a member here and, and so on. He couldn't be here to, today, but I can tell you then. And he said, well, we need good data visualization artists. But it's, it's, it's like a creative yeah, thing. So I think that was really interesting. And it, so it's very important then to build trust in how you got the data and how you get it. And also, I would like to say that, that the complexity in the landscape of regulations and laws around healthcare and this type of data is crucial to navigate in. So that's something that we help companies with. Thank you, Lota. And I'm thinking now, um, I would like to ask a um, company, PJ, you are in India, uh, representing the company Strand Life Science. And if we now go from talking about competence to actually talking about data, okay, how important is it for a company like yours to actually have access to data? And if, um, if you can please also explain a little sure. bit about Strand Life Science. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, so Strand was born about 21 years ago. Um, uh, we were four professors in data science and uh, in, at the Indian Institute of Science. And, uh, and we saw uh, the fourth paradigm of data-driven science taking hold in biology, particularly in molecular biology, with the Human Genome Project and so forth. And uh, so felt that there was an opportunity for uh, machine learning, data visualization, and so on to play a major role uh, in research biology. And, uh, and Strand actually started out as a bioinformatics uh, company, a platform company. Talent uh, in computer science was not an issue. Uh, I think we, we talk, we're teaching at India's top rank university uh, in data science and and AI, and, uh, and we were already ourselves uh, experts in machine learning and so forth. 
So uh, we were able to attract uh, excellent talent. We had to build the talent in biology, uh, which again, fortunately, the university uh, provided us uh, with that. I think uh, I'd just like to mention that uh, the talent, the competence that we sometimes lack uh, in doing these kinds of companies is uh, good product managers because, uh, you know, the uh, people are not uh, uh, necessarily trained in thinking about uh, uh, these advanced scientific products uh, and how, uh, you know, the market uh, needs uh, can be laid out. Uh, I think on the data issue, uh, at least um, to begin with, when we worked in research biology and built the tools for research biology, I think the, the, there was a lot of open data, uh, which uh, agencies like the NIH in the US through NCBI and the European uh, bioinformatics communities as well, the EBI and so forth, uh, EMBL had put out uh, uh, lots of open data sets. And uh, so we were able to build tools uh, by leveraging those open data sets. Um, and, um, and we were able to serve the scientific community, which was our initial customer base. When we got into healthcare, uh, the situation became different because uh, I think uh, that was about 10 years later. And uh, there, uh, you know, there's always a challenge of uh, getting high quality data along with the metadata and the clinical uh, metadata that you need to really make good AI inference. So uh, when it came to actually taking all of this bioinformatic knowledge into precision medicine, uh, there has been a challenge of finding good, good data for that. Yes, indeed. Thank you. And last now when the question or when the word in healthcare was mentioned. Uh, also, during the day, we have been talking a lot about AI Sweden, but not so much within the frame of healthcare. So can you explain for us what is AI Sweden, but with you, as you know, with the biotech healthcare touch on it? What are you doing there? I had a lot of other answers I would like to give first. <laughs> Please, <laughs> say yourself. One thing that, that I understand now, we talk about talent attraction. We talk about finding the people. Our problems in healthcare is that we can't employ them. We don't know what a data scientist is. We don't have a, a title for it. So, so we can't offer them anything. And when you start to think about working in a knowledge organization, like healthcare in some way are. We are really working with scientific things, research and so on. But we are also very well trained professionals. So we think we handle the world. So we need in a way open up here and, and, and find ways of working with companies in the new way of thinking. I used to sometimes joke and say institutions like uh, Sashin and VI represent here, we need institutions and industry to work together. Because if the industry do something that the institution is not supporting, it will not work. And if the industry will do something that is not supported by institutions either, it will not work. So I used to do that like a mathematician in square, so it becomes I2, okay? And who are we doing this for? At first now, I think we need to understand that healthcare probably is not so highly interested in automatization like we are in, in the car industry, for example. But we are more interest, interested in, in giving decision support. And we are in a relation between humans. So we are in a way just need a tap on the shoulder to understand what will be the best support we can give you and what is the decision support we will need. So therefore, I used to say 
it's about clinical staff and giving them context. And that in square, C2. So I2, C2. That's what the algorithm for me is to start on. <laughs> so when you come back here though, why are we interested in AI? We have been writing some textbooks about it in healthcare context, and we realized that we haven't seen anything so promising that we're not using at all. So it's it's some hurdles here we need to to take to to come to to the use of AI. Therefore, in in region Vestergötland, we supported very strongly the, that we established the AI Sweden. That is in a way an infrastructure for Sweden to work together. Even if we are a very small country, it's hard for us to work together. So therefore, I like the idea on, on bringing all these things together and working in a, in actually in a specific house like we do here in Lindholm and we have the, the hubs and nodes to, to meet others that has the same problems. So much we have learned now from, from the car industry here. When I realized that the same algorithm that is detecting the Swedish elk coming up on the road, we can use to detect the metastasis in the lungs. Then you start to see that collaboration is the way of doing things for the future. Was that an Thanks, answer on your question? Absolutely. And going from AI Sweden to Nora AI in Norway, I know that it's not exactly the same, but I would like you, Sachin, to please explain for us what is Nora AI and whether there are any, you know, there's some differences here with Sweden. First of all, I would be love to be with you guys, uh, with you, Iris and Lars. You've always uh, been so kind to me. So, uh, Pleasure being here, and uh, uh, in a way, Lars has already supported uh, 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 Nura. We wanted to build this Nordic AI meet, as Lars already pointed out, that Sweden is too small. And I think, uh, with his uh, previous background also in healthcare, uh, writing books about AI in healthcare, I think we all kind of agree that healthcare is the opportunity for Nordics. And Nordic collaboration is the most important topic. And uh, looking to cooperate uh, in a forum like this with Sweden, India, it could be also with Nordic India. And I think Sweden is already collaborating with uh, many Nordic countries on all kinds of healthcare topics. So here in Norway, I think uh, when we look at Norwegian AI Research Consortium, it started more of as a research, uh, heavy research uh, driven uh, ideology. But uh, AI Sweden, if we compare, you know, it's very much as uh, Lars said, it's about innovation. So we are definitely looking at innovation also in Norway and uh, not just we have the universities, but we also have the research organizations and startups. In Norway, unfortunately, we do not have large uh, healthcare multinationals like AstraZeneca in Gothenburg. So maybe there is a scope for AstraZeneca also to, you know, widen the scope of collaboration. And, you know, look uh, like Gothenburg and Oslo as a, you know, like they have in the southern uh, Sweden, you know, like Copenhagen region becomes like a wide area for uh, Malmo and uh, Lund. But I think uh, what I have understood so far that uh, the the wealth here in Norway lies in the digitized data. So some of the healthcare data exists for even for 50 years and Oslo cancer cluster, for example, is very much uh, you know sought after by Americans, for example. So I'm sure that uh, if we want to collaborate as Nordics, you know, attracting talent like Ola mentioned, you know, collaborating with India on cancer and these kind of topics could be very very interesting. Just to very quickly mention, Iris, uh, we organized two things. That one I already mentioned, the Nordic AI meet, where we had. Uh, top Swedish, uh, Finnish, uh, Norwegian, Danish, and Icelandic researchers coming on 1st and 2nd of November in Oslo. And we will continue to do this every year. So that will always be having Swedish input. And second thing, we recently did a large uh, AI in uh, life sciences workshop. So it was world's first alpha fold and Rosetta fold workshop. And I can see that uh, this AI in life sciences topic is uh, growing very fast. I think AstraZeneca has also made uh, 
significant investment in this direction recently novo nordisk has also been doing so i think this could also be one topic uh, where there could be a lot of potential especially india has a lot of pharma companies which maybe are uh, not looking at uh, these ai driven topics as much but maybe you know something to explore and uh, i don't know if i'm now digressing from the point but i i leave it uh, back Thank to you, you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so um, right now I would like to spend the next 20 minutes talking about business models. I think that we have touched a little bit upon collaborations here and I would like to go to Vijay in India. And yes, we talk about data, we talk about competencies, we talk about innovation, but what about implementation? How far have you actually come in India and what's your experience right. from the market? Oh. Um, well, as I mentioned, we're a pretty old company. Uh, so we've really sort of gone through different phases. I think um, uh, the first 10 years or so, we were essentially a tool builder. We, we built platform technologies for uh, analytics of data coming out of high throughput experiments in biology. And uh, and we were successful there in the sense that uh, roughly about uh, 30,000 citations in literature mention the tools that Strand has built. Um, so, you know, certainly had an impact. Um, the tools were, uh, you know, bundled with uh, large instrument companies like uh, Agilent and um, and uh, you know, Illumina also uses some of our technologies in the genomics space. Agilent uses it uh, for uh, both mass spectroscopy and uh, you know, and for gene expression, genotyping. So, um, so that was uh, you know that uh, in terms of implementation, uh, we became um, you know fairly uh active uh, software company uh with both shrink wrap software solutions and uh, and with uh, consulting services for uh, pharma and biotech globally right um i think uh, around little under 10 years ago maybe around 2012 we also decided to set up our own lab and uh, and to be able to do diagnostics and start offering precision medicine solutions to patients in India. And, um, and by learning how to do, uh, uh, you know, diagnostics in oncology and so forth, uh, we also expanded our, you know, our platforms and, uh, and our toolkit and uh, and expanded the business uh, opportunities uh, leveraging on that the impact within india on patients and healthcare has been limited partly because the cost of uh, things like whole genome sequencing has although it has come down very dramatically has still not reached that tipping point where it can actually have large public health impact and uh, so we are well poised, but we need the $100 genome to happen, not the $1,000 genome. And uh, we are probably, uh, you know, I think the world needs a little more competition on sequencing technology for that to happen. Uh, I think right now it's, uh, it's uh, you know, there isn't enough competition to bring the prices down further. And I think uh, we're hoping to, uh, be ready to have large public health impact with things like early detection of cancer and uh, liquid biopsies and various uh, tests for rare genetic disorders and so on, all of which are very important from a healthcare perspective. And uh, so the challenge in implementation is really accessibility in terms of affordability in, uh, in countries like India. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I know that we have in Sweden similar challenges as well, but 
Nevertheless, I also know that Solgrenska University Hospital was actually one of the first hospitals in Sweden to digitalize the radiology services. And last you and I, I know kind of a one and a half, two years ago, just before the pandemic, we were discussing about different business models to see how we could actually work with India. And because I like to be concrete, I could ask you whether you saw any challenges or whether you see opportunities. Can we actually work with India? If we have a need here, can they solve it? <laughs> I will answer another <laughs> question first. <laughs> no, I, I really is fascinating when we when we from healthcare organizations try to understand business models. Lotta has learned me a lot about this here and, and, and others also. And for me, it's starting to be rather clear that the business model for healthcare will be prevention and prediction. Because that's the only way we can do something about rare disease and, and precision medicine. Okay. So that's why we have an obligation as healthcare to start to structure our data. It was easy in radiology in some way because the image looks more or less the same and is built up with pixels. When we looked at it in VGR, when we looked at just a standard thorax image, we called that examination in 16 different ways. So as a data scientist, it's not easy to find the images you would like to know about. We have no way of actually annotate our images on how to, to find them and, and they start to tell us what they have and so on. So that's one of the troubles. But the great thing with concentrating at the domain one and one is that you get awareness of the producers and they start to realize how different they do things and the demand from, from the professional will be that they demand the harmonization of it. So today it's much easier in, in VDR to find all x-rays that is produced both from, from uh, officials like we and private companies that is using it also. And we combine it together with the dental images. We're starting to combine with pathology images and so on. So what I'm saying is that I think it's important for for organizations to start to think shared infrastructures, that you really put the infrastructure in place on doing that. And we see now a tendency in Sweden, as you might know, that, that the government is saying to other uh, agencies that you should now build up something around this. We are following in the TEDAS project in Europe, we are looking at Gaia X and everyone is saying, well, it can be others than Google and Microsoft and Apple that collect things. So I guess that's an answer from me. Yes, thank, thank you. you. And I heard a lot the word in collaboration. So I'm going to go back to Ula because I know that AstraZeneca is one of the companies that, are, that have been talking a lot about collaboration and that you actually have opened innovation like you know at the core of everything you do and while listening to Lash what I'm asking myself is are we naive can we actually share data freely what what is your feedback so I as a big company of as course as a big company <laughs> and I try to give a concrete answer as well uh, so first the start when we start to discuss data first I think we need to mention the ethics of course as a big company, the ethics around data is paramount for us, particularly around the clinical data. Uh, so, so basically, if you go to the Asta homepage, you can read about the, our ethics standards when it comes to handle data from patients. It's of course true both what we do internally and in our collaboration. Uh, and then of course, we, we have a lot of proprietary data that we, we, we can't really share with the public or in many cases with a partner, but we try to find innovative ways how you can still derive value together uh, from the data. 
And one area we're looking into is what is called privacy preserving machine learning. So you do machine learning, uh, but everyone have the data still within the firewall, could be on AWS and so on. And then you train the data uh, together through what's called a feed forward deep learning neural network. So, so the data is not leaving your AWS instance, but the different layers with the weights uh, in your deep, uh, uh, so to say, uh, deep deep learning model are actually going to a, so to say, a server, but it's trained together. So there we, we can basically get improved models uh, iteratively without sharing the underlying data. So that's one, I think, innovative aspects we're looking into exploit and we i'm involved with personally in a big european project around that they called melody with 10 different pharma companies but we have data several billion data points in total uh, up to 10 million molecules but we then try to do the the privacy preserving machine learning to improve what's called activity prediction how well a compound binds to a protein and then we have the open innovation aspect and i think that's that's really important uh, and uh, as Iris mentioned open innovation is yeah we, we, we really need to not only sort of say develop ideas internally but also get ideas from uh, the <clears throat> external world from all over the world so we have an open innovation portal we can go and look and see which challenges we have at the moment around data ai but also other fields like drug delivery uh, and we also try to put data set in the public domain where we can because we think that's a really good way to increase the innovation in a field we have seen that in in several fields around reaction informatics and so on that if you put the data set in the public domain the algorithm development will go much quicker and we are working in one project now but we'll put a really big image data set in the public domain where we can see when we test molecules on a cellular system and we see they, how we, they change through the images, we put the data in the public domain so people can predict what is the mode of action of the compounds. Thank you, my goodness. So I think that you have mentioned a lot of very concrete opportunities for how or can I give business a model. Quick yes, comment? please, Jopin. I like the way you explain that difficult question. What we did in practice with AI Sweden and looking at Mats Nolan here from AI Sweden was that we brought VGR to that physical place. So when we are using their edge lab, it's actually a part of VGR. So then we come around a lot of the legal aspects and so on. So it was quite fun. And, and I think you, you are pointing at the direction we see we all have to go. We are too afraid of of just sharing by giving away, but we are interesting on sharing our data by giving access to it, as you talk about federated or edge or whatever we call it. That's, That's a comment. Right. Thank you. That's right. And Lotta, back to you. Um, I know that digital health companies from the region and all life science companies, they are also asking for more collaborations with the payers, with the healthcare, with the academia. And I would like to know and you can explain for the audience how is Solgreska Science Park and no pressure <laughs> supporting them. Yes, I was thinking about collaboration and in Nordics, as you mentioned here before. I, I want them to to mention the Nordic collaboration we have actually running together with partners in Norway and in Denmark. Uh, we are running uh, the largest community of health tech companies in Europe. It's called Health Tech Nordic. So we meet about 300 companies mm -hmm. within health tech. And uh, so we see many companies, innovative early companies that wants to make a change and have crazy ideas. So we learn a lot from that. Many of those companies want to, to meet and come into the market of uh, healthcare. But we, so they come to us and we try to educate them on all the hurdles. And why is that they want to come in? Well, it's health tech. Yeah, so we should go into healthcare. But no, we say, well, maybe not. You need, you need to verify your market and your solution into a real life 
setting. But maybe you should start with another market more ready for these kind of uh, techniques and so on. So actually now we're very happy that uh, here in, in, in the city also we have large companies in automotive and so on that are ready for this. Mm -hmm. So just to mention one example, we have two, two police officers actually um, mm -hmm. having Absolutely. one company that is um, uh, looking at drug abuse. No, dr not drug, what do we call it? Drug, drug addict. addict yeah. 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 Drug addict. Yeah, and uh, through an uh, AI-based algorithm in, within your smartphone. So, and they wanted to go into the hospital area first. And we said, no, we don't think so, but maybe we should try to the automotive industry. And so now they have collaborations with, with the car industry and uh, with schools and so on uh, in order to verify the technique and does it work and so on. And then you can move on to healthcare. Mm -hmm. So this cross-sector collaboration is really a key, we think. And we got a lot to learn from each other's different perspectives and open the eyes. And, there to bring others from the healthcare, mm. as you say, to listen to the solution in another setting. It's it's not dangerous, mm. yeah. So and then to start slowly moving it into the healthcare sector. So so that's the way we we work, and uh, so we run an accelerator at Sargenska Science Park where we meet many companies, and if we see a problem in various companies such as the regulations and uh, the importance of having them have to, to look at them, them very early on. Then we start an open innovation project where we invite companies as in uh, AstraZeneca and uh, academics and, and so on. So to learn more and to share more about the learnings. Mm. So we work in two different levels there. Thank you. Mm? Slight test bits. So the first time, Pia is reaching Pia, do you want to say something? Yes, I, I wanted to also bring out uh, this uh, interesting idea that, uh, you know, you could have cross-domain uh, expertise flow. And I think, uh, um, you know, I also am an advisor to the AI and robotics tech park at the university, at uh, the Indian Institute of Science. And I think um, the CEO, Uma Khan, is at this conference. Um, and um, you know, one of the things we had was confidential computing and federated uh, uh, data approaches uh, that were very effective in applications to smart city projects. And we're also looking at various applications in FinTech. And, uh, and now we're trying to apply a lot of that uh, methodology in healthcare. And, uh, and so there are some conversations going on with, uh, you know, hospitals and uh, the Indian uh, Council of Medical Research on how to establish uh, hub and spoke models of uh, various uh, hospitals around uh, medical data associated with, uh, uh, with imaging and, uh, and other types of uh, medical data, and yet uh, allow the data to remain within the hospital and still be uh, used um, as uh, gold standard data sets for developing new methodologies and so forth. So, okay. so I think it's, uh, it's an idea that uh, certainly uh, came from completely different domains, but That's now uh, starting to utilize them in, in healthcare. Yeah, so uh, I think like um, it is clear that there are, there are similarities but still the healthcare system in Sweden and India of course there is not the same there are you know and I remember when I was in India kind of three four years ago I was impacted by a business model and you as so correct me <laughs> that uh, you have in India that I think we can call it kind of economy of scale you know very lean way of providing healthcare service to many people, you know, like you do in the industry. And I would like to ask you, Sachin, I don't know whether I was right, okay? Do you think that digitalization and AI would substitute in India at, at least this kind of economy of scale, as you know, very lean 
way of making it more efficient and effective. I think you are very correct. It is uh, that uh, business-wise, uh, Nordics or Sweden is very different than India when it comes to healthcare delivery. So majority of the Indian healthcare is privately run. And of course, uh, then excess becomes a big issue. 80% of the Indian hospitals serve the 20% of the hospital uh, of the population and 20% of the healthcare setup, you know, kind of caters to 80% of the population. So this kind of, uh, you know, asymmetry uh, is uh, very good for digital to, you know, serve. And uh, one of the company, which is part of your event today, Cure.ai, I think in India, we are very proud of this company. So they have used AI as a screening, uh, you know, uh, as like uh, Lars said, as a decision support tool. During COVID, for example, they had uh, these kind of uh, mobile vehicles where they would take it to rural areas or, you know, slums, and they could screen people uh, using chest X-ray, for example, for COVID. And one of the founder who is a good friend of mine, he always says that the best thing about AI is that it is not differentiating in quality. So if I am a rich person in India, maybe I can get to the best hospital. If I'm a poor person, maybe I'll not get to the best hospital, which means the quality of care will be different based on your income levels. But when you use a digital service, digital service is not distinguishing based on your income levels or your geographical location. So I think the biggest uh, benefit that we see in a country like India when we use AI as a screening tool, I'm not saying that it is the absolute, uh, you know, diagnostic approach, but in many of the therapeutic or disease areas, AI would be very handy in a country like India, where we can use it as a point of care, you know, rapid diagnostic kind of approach. I think, in fact, Pawan has not joined this panel today, but uh, I think if we combine Pawan's solution from Sweden, although he's from India as well, you know, with something what Cure is doing, it makes a perfect combination. So to answer your question in short, is AI uh, re replacing? Probably not. Is it an add-on? So before COVID, you know, I think nobody really took uh, digital seriously in India. But now the Prime Minister has announced uh, a mission for digital health. And I think uh, the clinicians, which were not very, uh, you know, uh, let's say not all of them, but most of them were a bit reluctant, you know, adopting digital services. But now uh, COVID has changed that behavior. So whatever change was to come in terms of 10 years, I think many people say that already. So that change has come in a matter of one year or so. Mm -hmm. So I think digital is here to stay and it is going to assist a uh, lot of, uh, you know, uh, clinicians in India. And especially with the asymmetry that I talked about in terms of populations access to healthcare. So I think AI would be more useful to the poor people than to the rich people. That's okay. my understanding. So Can AI, I, yes, please. I, I like the, your way, Sachin and Via, of talking about the collaboration. I like Lotta's explanation on how to collaborate and so on. When I'm at the head of, health office and I become sad because nothing is happening. I used to go to Lotta and have a cup of coffee <laughs> and realize that it can be done. And I think that the hardest thing is that we, we don't understand that digitalization is passing between all the silos. So that's, no one will take the responsibility for it. So that's, that's rather hard. But when I think about what we have discussed, me and Sachin many times, that the machine readable will be the future of Esperanto. Everything that can be machine readable can be shared without thinking of any borders. So it means that any solution that is brought in India can immediately almost be used somehow that type of knowledge, at least the algorithm here in Sweden and vice versa. So we need the, those smart people that do the modeling around it, that, that makes the shape of it, that makes it attractive for us to, to use and understand it. And I think Astra is probably the, the best 
company I know about making things machine readable in a way so it can be be shared. And as you say, what we understand more and more is is sharing is about being open to 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 open up your data and so on. I don't know if we have the time, but I'm I'm a little bit tipping on to synthetic data, but it might be another panel. We can but I've got a question, on. but please okay. go on. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, <laughs> we're all talking about here with uh, healthcare. And I, I really would like to say about those, of those 300 companies that we have within this Nordic community, very few are actually heading to towards healthcare. Mm. They're heading towards patients not wanting to be patients anymore. Mm. So it's remote yes, care or it's prevention. So they don't want to be ill. <laughs> so they want to know what can I do about mm. it. So it's much to it's much more to handle what what, what can we do with this Fitbits mm. and the data that we have on us on us mm. all all day and so on. And you mentioned the magic word patient and Sachin because we have been talking about data, yeah, you know, life science companies, healthcare, but I think that um, the focus of everything we do, it's patient and it's health. And I know that you have been working during the last two, three years. I don't know whether it is a website or an app, but as it's something that you have very close to heart and I would like you to please explain what is it. Yeah, so thanks, Iris. So I, uh, you know, like uh, what uh, Charlotte mentioned, just you know, like people don't want to be, you know, at the receiving end and, you know, just uh, want to take charge of what's happening with them. So I think uh -huh. we are definitely moving, like what Lars also mentioned, towards, you know, uh, what do you say, preventive healthcare. And I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in 2018. And it was so severe that I lost my vision uh, for six days. And uh -huh. I could reverse my diabetes in six months. Thanks to all the healthcare experts that were around me. And the lesson learned was that diabetes is not a disease, it's a condition. And I met some of the most interesting people in the field of diabetes, in fact, in Lund, so in the Lund University Diabetes Center. So for me, when I started this project, which I call it as experiments with sugar.in, that's the website, I thought, you know, what I have benefited, maybe I could share with at least uh, 1 million people in India. And, uh, you know, one easy way to do that is that, okay, maybe bring together those people who want, who are interested in taking charge of themselves and preventive healthcare. I mean, if we focus just on diabetes here is all about monitoring your own body. So what's your blood glucose level? So for example, about selling, uh, you know, uh, equipment, which can give your, uh, blood sugar level every minute or so. So people are now building, you know, very well funded startups in India today, which are just working on these kind of diagnostic devices. Now, this is one part of the solution. The, the, the most important part that helped me was eating well. And I think uh, market, you know, serves you <coughs> the best food that market gives you is sugar. I think in Norway, there is a tax on sugar. I don't know about Sweden, but uh, we need to recognize, uh, you know, these simple things. And I'm a vegetarian. So in India, uh, no wonder why we have so many diabetic people because, you know, vegetarian food doesn't have protein. And that was another of my, uh, you know, big insight that uh, if we include more protein in our diet, we will end up eating less carbs and which will be helping me in the long run to maintain my blood sugar levels. So I don't want to go into a longer thing, but I would say that if you take any disorder, uh, that people are going to spend money life lifetime. Maybe it's bad for pharma companies in that sense. But, uh, you know, when you are looking at somebody in India who are 1800 million people with diabetes, it's very good customer base for hospitals and for pharma companies. But if those people want to take charge of their own self, they need to know about their body, how their body reacts with XYZ, for which they need a lot of digital health solutions. They need a lot of diagnostic uh, approaches which are self-managed and then they need, uh, you know, uh, some expertise by which they can translate all this information into the action that they need to take. For example, they do, do they need exercise? Do they need uh, to eat uh, XYZ stuff? And I think if we combine these two things, 
you know we can overcome not just diabetes maybe but many other conditions so uh, that's a short snippet uh, iris i don't know if that was yes were... indeed so, um lash before i give you the uh, I, word i like yeah? this type of philosophic discussion <laughs> I, I was thinking last summer a lot, who am I, my data or my narrative story? Because if we are concentrating too much on the data part, it can be very complicated. And, and we need to find that true balance. And I think that one of the things I, I learned from Charlotte and, and, and AI Sweden is, for example, when Volvo talked with us that said, we think we can see early signs of Alzheimer's, and as your police is said also. So then suddenly you get the image when it's on the display, it says today, Lars, you are tired, take a cup of coffee. The next time they will say, we close the doors and bring you to the hospital now. But what I'm trying to, to say is that I think that we need to balance all these sensor technology to give the feedback when it makes sense. And therefore, we need also to educate our citizens on how to use this. And that's, that's a great challenge. And that's not a challenge that is, will be taken on by healthcare, because we just love sick people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to defend AstraZeneca, but I know that you are also working a lot with preventive health. Yeah. And I think I encourage you, you please, to visit AstraZeneca website. And I think that the name is Health Works, but you also have a lot of focus on patients. And we have six, seven minutes to end this panel. And I would love to have questions from the audience. We are after lunch, I know, but please, any question to anybody from the panel or the people online. Come on. Just one chance. <laughs> <laughs> Any question to AstraZeneca, to the healthcare AI Sweden? Thank you. Yeah, I can just mention here, uh, I, in Europe, at least, uh, about about uh, three to four percent of the total costs for healthcare mm -hmm. is actually put into preventive care. Even though that you know that every every <laughs> every amount spent in that field will save you a lot of money in the end. So if you're not sick enough, you're not welcome to the healthcare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we know that people actually want to spend even more on preventive healthcare and not getting sick than paying the actual bill that we have to do in Sweden. Even the, though that it's, I mean, we it's not that high <laughs> as it is in 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 the private markets. But uh, even though it's, yes. it's quite interesting. Yes, VJ. Uh, I would like to give you, you know, kind of the last words. Uh, what is the future for a company like yours? You are in precision medicine, genomics, oncology, AI. What's the future? Right. Um, well, um, you know, I think uh, we are very focused on uh, the idea of um, uh, preventive and early detection of uh, disorders using various omics uh, technologies. And I think um, uh, that would uh, certainly be one path in towards the future of, uh, for us to uh, be able to uh, you know, detect 
cancer early because I think uh, India basically adds about uh, one and a half million new patients every year in cancer. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, I, I believe that the cancer can be managed much better and the survival rates uh, can really be improved if we were uh, able to detect cancer early. So I think that's, uh, yeah. that's infection one. control, because I know many, many people, ah, sorry, we have a question from the public, please. We are not sorry for that. Yeah. We're happy that we have it. <laughs> I like to have a conversation. Okay, it was a big question for two minutes left, but who can answer it in the quickest way? First, we have to map it. There is actually a big project here going on now, together with the University of Gothenburg and uh, the healthcare, uh, and, and where we map the landscape of all the regulation that you have ahead of you within health tech. So that's a start. And I think from my viewpoint, Sweden has addressed this question now for quite a few years and we are working, it, it has moved up so it's almost on the highest level now so we will make decisions. What we see is that we we are influenced by Finland and their Fin data and we see to try to find collaboration of doing this. From the European horizon we are putting in a lot of money now to, to regulate how we can use data for this purpose. That's why I said we can talk later on I think that synthetic data can be a kickoff for testing your IDs in, in the first way. And from the industry point of view, any regulation affecting? Uh, uh, of course, I mean, we, we, it's, a, it's a regulated area and it needs to be a regulated area because it's patient. Mm. Of course, but we, of course, work also with all the regulatory authorities to, to discuss, discuss with them the, the path forward for, for medicines and if it could be accompanying uh, part that is digital to the medicine. Thank you. And you got the last words. Okay, and I you. want to please an applause to the fantastic.